In the evening hours of the 15th of October 1987, another unfortunate assassination of an African head of state was underway in the Bokinabe capital, Ouagadougou. Thomas Isidore Noel Sankara, the president of Burkina Faso, had just been overthrown and assassinated along with members of his cabinet. In this edition of His Pool Media, we bring to your view a detailed account of his last day on earth and his last words. This video is inspired by an article he was called Sankara, published by his acquaintance and editor-in-chief of Join Africa, Senen Andrea Mirado, in 1989, just two years after his death. Welcome to His Pool Media In-Depth History. But before we get started, remember to like this video and if you are new here, consider subscribing to His Pool Media. Thank you. When Miriam, the wife of the president, woke up that day, Thomas Sankara, who had finally joined her in bed in his own tongue, was already asleep. On her tiptoes, the president's wife leaves the room and prepares to go to work. She was to be there at 3 p.m. Sankara will sleep for another hour because this daily nap is the only time he gets to recover. This break was all the more important seeing as the afternoon and the night of that day, 15th of October 1987, were going to be long. At 4 p.m., he leads one of the three weekly meetings for his special cabinet. On the agenda of the meeting, a report from one of his advisors who had just returned from Cotonou where he was speaking with the leader of the Revolutionary People's Party of Benin and collecting documents on the Beninese Code of Revolutionary Conduct. The second agenda was a project to create a newspaper of the CNRU, the National Council of the Revolution. At 8 p.m., there will be a complicated meeting regarding the OMR, the Revolutionary Military Organization. Around 3.30 p.m., Miriam Sankara called him on the phone, but his eldest son, Felipe, who was seven years old at the time, answered the phone and said, Daddy is in the shower. She calls back 10 minutes later. The president who was in sportwear since the morning, wearing white t-shirt and red jogging trousers, is ready to leave. First, I'm going to my 4 p.m. meeting at the council d'Etente, he said to his wife on the phone. Then, I'm going to sport at 5 p.m. Afterwards, I will probably come home for a shower, but you wouldn't be home yet. I won't see you until after 8 p.m. meeting. We will talk tonight, he concluded the phone call. He would also receive offers from the African Reports partners. In the meantime, the members of the special cabinet have begun to arrive in one of the villas of the cartel council, which serves as the headquarters of the NCRU. Aluna Traore and Pauline Babu Mamuni made a detour through the offices to the presidency just opposite. The others, Bonaventure Campaure, Frederick Kemde, and Patrice Zagre, came directly to the council. Christophe Saba, the permanent secretary for the CNRU, has been there since the morning. At 4.20 p.m., he decided to call the president who had not yet left his residence. He was talking with another one of his advisors, the deputy director of the presidential press, Sergi Teofili Balima. We are here, Mr. President. It is late and we are waiting for you, he said. I will be right there, Sankara replied. He sends Balima back and gets into a black Peugeot 205. The president sat in the passenger seat, as usual. I like to see the road, and from behind, you won't see anything, he often had to explain. In the back seat were two bodyguards. The car following them is occupied by three other bodyguards, plus the driver, also a soldier. They are all dressed in sportwear. This Thursday afternoon, twice a week, in fact, on Mondays and Thursdays from 5 p.m., the Bukinabe are supposed to be exercising themselves. The president and his guards are therefore only armed with their automatic pistols. At the council chambers, the members of the special firm were also dressed in sportwear with the exception of Pastry Zagre, who came in a mouth jacket. At 4.30 p.m., the president arrives. He got out of the 205 Peugeot car followed by four of his guards who settled in the corridor adjoining the meeting rooms. 
The drivers parked the two cars in a nearby courtyard and took shelter from the sun in the shades of the tall tree, particularly the neem trees which lined the garden. At 4.35 p.m., the chairman takes a seat at the end of the U-shaped meeting table. Warrant Officer Christoph Saba, Pauline Bamuni, and Frederick Kimde are seated to his right. And to his left are Patrick Zagre, Bonaventure Kampauri, and Aluna Traore. Thomas Sankara, who was always late but always in a hurry, opened the working session. He said, let's make it quick, let's start. The first report is from Aluna Traore, who had left on a fact-finding mission in Kotonu the previous day. He said, I left Ouagadougou the day before yesterday at 6 p.m. He stops, his voice suddenly muffled by the sound of a most likely pierced exhaust pipe from an approaching vehicle. Shocked and annoyed, Sankara asks, what is that noise? He was soon joined by Saba, who frowns, what is that noise? According to the only direct witness who survived the attack, the noise gets louder as a car, a Peugeot 504 or a covert Toyota approached. The car stopped in front of the small gate of the villa. Immediately, the noise of the engine was covered by the roaring sound of Kalachnikov rifle shots. The seven men gathered in a room flat on the floor, hiding behind the armchairs. Among them, the only one to be armed, since his guards remain in the corridor or in the garden, was Thomas Sankara, who grabs his gun, which he had placed on the table within reach. From outside, someone shouts, Get out! Come out! Sankara gets up, sighs loudly, and orders his counselors, Stay! Stay! It is me they want. He leaves the meeting room with his hands in the air. He had barely stepped out of the door before he was shot, says Aluna Traore. The attackers had come to kill. The guards, the drivers, and the biker from the police saw Repatinema, who came by chance to bring mails to the CNRU headquarters, had all been shot in the first burst of gunfire. A former member of President of Faso's Guard, a man nicknamed Otis, who had since then been reinstated in the ranks of the paracommandos of P.O. commanded by Captain Blaise Compaore, who made him one of his drivers, burst into the meeting room, pushes the president's collaborators towards the exit door, while shouting, Out! Get out! Get out! All those who obeyed were shot in turn. At the last moment, Patrick Zagre tries to take refuge in the meeting room, but a shot in the back finishes him off. Aluna Traore, through sheer fear or survivorship, perhaps both, found himself lying on the gravel alive, bathed in the blood of his comrades, whose moans and sigh of agony he hears as if he was in a nightmare. Four civilian members of the special cabinet, Pauline Bamuni, Patrice Zagre, Frederick Kemde, and Bonaventure Campauri, along with eight soldiers including Warrant Officer Christoph Saba, a poor police officer who was passing by, the drivers of the presidential convoy, and four bodyguards were all shot. Aluna Traore stepped over the president of Faso's body without even realizing it. Looking over his shoulder, he sees Tomon Sankara on the floor. Two shots to the head had immediately finished him. He heard someone shouting, There is one who is not dead, the one in blue, let him get up. Then, Aluna Traore, the man in the blue tracksuit, stood up. He was told to move forward and then lie back on the ground between two other bodies, those of the two drivers. He feels agitated. He was covered in blood but without a scratch on him. Around him, the commandos are still firing, but this time in the air, as if they wanted the outside world to believe that there was a fight going on within the walls of the Council Dietente, and with acrimony, as if they wanted to believe that they were fighting and defending themselves. This went on for about 30 minutes, and they used up their ammunition this way. The Council Dietente transformed into an execution field. But Aluna Traore is still on the ground, waiting for his fate to be decided. From the corner of his eye, he sees the driver guard of Captain Blaise Kampauri, Hamidou Maiga, 
walking towards him wearing a blue mechanic overall. He looks at Aluna and says to the others, leave it, I will finish him off. But an officer, I don't know him, Aluna Traore will say later. His face was scarred, objected and shouted, bring me the survival. Aluna Traore is brought to him and he orders him to lie down again. The survivor tries to crawl and get close to the wall. Stay still, he shouted, otherwise you will join the others. How long did he stay like that on the floor? Well, two or three hours, he says, without further explanation until a soldier threatened him. You saw everything. We can let you live like that. You are going to join the others. Aluna Traore doesn't understand the situation he was in. He has gone beyond the stage of fear and has taken refuge in the world of the absurd. And for now, his only desire is to urinate. Well, he is allowed to do so and he goes to relieve himself between the flowers of the garden of the council d'Etente, a place that has just been transformed into a killing field that very evening. He was then taken upstairs to the floor of the villa where CNRU agents were grouped together who heard everything without having seen anything of the drama. The doctor warrant officer Yusufu Drago, assistant to the warrant officer Christoph Saba and the whole secretariat of the Lawrence Kabore who also worked at the CNRU. In the middle of them, he was surprised to discover Bosobe, a guard of the president. Aluna Traore's blue spot outfit is soaked in blood at this time. His hands, face and hair are bloody. He is told to wash himself and then to sit down. Long after the sun had set, Aluna hears cars maneuvering in the alleys of the cartel council. He risks a glance out through the window. The 13 corpses have disappeared and tankers are cleaning the scenes of the drama with large water jets. Turning over and over in his head is the same question, what could the president have done to deserve this? Relaunched at the beginning of 2015 by the transitional regime after the fall of Blaise Kampaure, the investigation into the assassination of Thomas Sankara is being conducted by the military examining magistrate Francis Yamego. Out of the 17 people he has charged, six are in pre-trial detention, including Gilbert Yendere, Blaise Kampaure's former private chief of staff. Two other indictees accused of having played a major role in the case are still at large in Burkina Faso and are the subject of an international arrest warrant. They are Blaise Kampaure and Hyacinth Kafandu. Exiled to Abidjan, Kampaure is not expected to face George Yamego anytime soon as the Ivorian authorities seem reluctant to extradite him. Former head of Kampaure's close guards and leader of the squad that murdered Sankara, was summoned by the judge on the 22nd of June 2015. But the former member of parliament never appeared before the military court. He fled the country without leaving a trace. Many sources have claimed that he is also a refugee in Cote d'Ivoire. Apart from Count Paure and Kafandu, most of the suspects were trialed. Summoned twice in 2016 by George Yamego, Salih Diallo, the former head of Count Paure, who is already dead, denied any responsibility to do with the assassination of Sankara. He also added that Blaise Kampaure could not ignore what was being planned. As for Gilbert Dienda, he said he has not been informed of any operation against Sankara and that it was Hyacinth Kafando who took the initiative. George Yamego, for his part, is interested in possible foreign involvement, in particular France, Ivory Coast and Togo. He has sent a letter of request to Paris asking for the lifting of the defense secrecy on certain archives and the hearings of various people. The French authorities responded in May, saying that they have no objection but that they first need to obtain a certain number of clarifications. So, do you think there was a possible international collaboration to remove Thomas Sankara? Please leave a comment below. Remember to book the like button on this video and if you are new to our channel, Please subscribe and enable notifications so you don't miss any of our future updates. And I will see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching. Peace.